Okay, guys, so welcome to our second session on the Odyssey of Homer. Um, so before I begin, right, now that we're going to go into each particular book, uh, it's, let, let's take a step back and kind of, again, situate the text, okay? And I want to situate the text in two broad, uh, two broad themes. The first is Greek mythology, which we're going to get to, okay, the Greek worldview. And the second is the theme that we began with and that we address in the syllabus, which is what we refer to as the human condition. And when we spoke about the human condition, we said that we can reduce it simplistically, of course, to two broad questions, at least there are two broad questions that we want to address, right? And those are the question of man's origin, the question that we ask when we say something, when we ask something such as, where do I come from, right? Or who am I? What am I? And so forth. Uh, and then the question of what do I do? What is my faith? What is my destiny? What is my purpose, right? Uh, and remember, we had the example of um, man being born into this empty room and then asking those existential questions. And similarly, these are the questions that man asks when he becomes conscious of the universe around him. And we said that each one of these questions constantly plays out in literature. And in the same way, we saw these questions uh, being posed in the ancient Sumerian culture with Gilgamesh, we will find it also heavily being posed and addressed by Homer in the uh, Odyssey of Homer. Now, the 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 text, this text in particular it addresses multiple themes. It discusses the Odyssey of Homer. It discusses the issue of mortality and immortality, right? We have the gods who are immortal and we have Odysseus and humans that are mortal. We have the issue of arrogance versus humility. We have the issue of morality. What is morality? We have this issue of justice. We have the issue of fate. We have the question of love. Right, So there are multiple themes playing out in the Odyssey of Homer. And similarly, there are multiple questions and interpretations that we can focus on in the Odyssey of Homer. Now, we want to focus on uh, three key themes. The first is alienation and anguish. The second is the issue of free will and choice. And the third is the question of project and projection, right? The way in which man defines or determines his or her destiny in the world. So the text, the Odyssey of Homer, provides us with a very nice introduction into each of these three themes because it kind of brings them out um, quite explicitly. And it doesn't bring them out in a philosophical discourse, but it brings it out for us in the form of a story, in the form of a narrative. In the same way, we saw how some, some contemporary shows like Breaking Bad and movies like Warm Bodies and whatnot address certain existential concerns. The Odyssey of Homer is no different, right? And it is a very good starting point for us to do so. So what we will do today, inshallah, is that we will go through the first three readings, the first three books, book one, five, and six, and then we will look at the themes of alienation and anguish. Now, before that, the Odyssey of Homer, right? What is its context? Where, where, where does it come from? So as we said, the Odyssey of Homer is a sequel to another book, another story, 
which was just as infamous, and that was the Iliad. Now, the Iliad covered the 10 years that were known as the Trojan War. And so the Iliad kind of goes through the famous battles of Odysseus and his heroic actions and what you would expect to find in a war story, basically. So now imagine, you know, you're a Greek student living at the time of Homer and you're waiting for the sequel, right? You're waiting for part two. What happens after the battle ends? What happens after all of those grand victories? What happens to our hero, Odysseus? Now, one would expect, as us students in the modern world, as, you know, uh, viewers of, you know, these action-packed movies and uh, under, you know, slogans like impossible is nothing and in an age in which man is trying to conquer space through the space force or sending private spaceships up until up to outside into the orbit and so forth one would expect another sort of heroic tale right another battle perhaps mm -hmm. but that's not what we find we find something actually far more interesting we find Homer trying to show us another dimension, another facet of the human condition. And he tries to do this through Odysseus, through the hero, the commander, the war uh, general, Odysseus. And book one begins with a shock. It begins with a shock, okay? A, a, a dramatic opening. And we find uh, Odysseus stranded on an island, weeping, and it is not the island of Zeus, but the island of a female god, a goddess, Calypso. So he is in this miserable state, right? And he is clearly torn by a sense of anguish and a sense of alienation and we will discuss what alienation means so briefly put he is homeless and by homeless here we do not mean homeless in the sense just in the sense of a homeless person not having a residency but homeless in the existential sense right in the spiritual and in the mental sense of the word similarly Homer introduces a parallel story, which is the story of his son, right? Now, his son, similarly, is depicted as being helpless and lost amidst a group of suitors who are coming to ask for the hand of his mother, Penelope. So, Telemachus is similarly in a state of homelessness and in a state of anguish and in a state of alienation. So we have two stories that will develop in parallel. We have the story of Odysseus and we have the story of Telemachus. And both of them will, in, uh, will embark on their own metaphorical journey of the self towards the fulfillment of the self, which like we said on Tuesday, is the quest for authenticity, the question of where to, this desire to be true to the self and to fulfill the purpose of the self, right? Some sort of self-actualization, which is in and of itself, like we saw and with, with, with Gilgamesh, which is in and of itself a human need. In the same way, survival, love, community is a human need. Self-actualization, is a human need. Now, in book five, Homer wants to introduce us to the type of world that uh, that uh, uh, Gilg that uh, Odysseus occupies, and so he introduces us to the gods. Right? We are told that the gods convene on Mount Olympus, and they take a decision 
Like, remember, here it is not Odysseus who takes the decision, it is who? It is the gods take a decision to allow Odysseus to return home. So here we already have some clues in terms of how the story is going to play out and who the different actors are, right? So the one who determines how the story ends is not only our hero, Odysseus, but Homer is telling us that no, he complicates the story for us and introduces us to the gods who must first agree that Odysseus can now go home. But of course, there's a catch that one of the gods, Poseidon, is not there, right? He's not there on the agreement. Now, who are these gods? And what is the nature of these gods, right? Homer gives us another clue. Through the speech that is given by Calypso. So what happens is, if we want to plot the story, right, we begin with Odysseus being stranded on this island and essentially a slave or a companion to Calypso, who is a female goddess. And then we jump to Ithaca, where Telemachus is facing these suitors who are trying to take over the palace and marry his mother, the wife of um, Odysseus. And now we jump to Mount Olympus, where the gods say, okay, it is time to let Odysseus go back home, to set out on his journey home. And so they send a messenger, Athena sends a messenger to uh, Calypso, basically tell him, look, this is what the gods have agreed to. It is time for you to let Odysseus go back home. Now, up until now, at least in my reading, the impression one would have had about Calypso would have been a negative impression. But lo and behold, we are given a uh, twist, wherein Calypso delivers a speech against the gods' hypocrisy. She says that I was the one who had taken care of and who had shown hospitality and hosted Odysseus this whole time. And why is it that the Greek gods, such as Zeus, for example, can engage in affairs, sexual affairs, with uh, 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 female uh, with, with females or with, with the humans and so forth. But when a female goddess does so, it is unacceptable, right? So what are we introduced to here? Here we're introduced to a very, very important feature of Greek mythology and of the world that, uh, that our friend uh, Odysseus occupies, which is that it is a world dominated by gods who have human-like qualities. Gods who have human-like qualities, meaning that some of them are arrogant, some of them have love, some of them are just, and that they compete with one another, and that in some cases they're inde indecisive, and, they are, and even they might have the characteristic of being hypocritical, as Calypso points out, right? Now, finally, Calypso agrees and helps Odysseus set out on his journey back to uh, Ithaca. And this is where his journey begins. Now, let's kind of go back first. So that's the plot. Let's go back and delve into each plot. Um, let's delve into each theme one by one. So what is the image that uh, uh, Homer is trying to depict for us in his description of Homer as being stranded on this island, weeping and so forth? So this introduces us to a, a, a feature of the human condition, and that is the condition of alienation, 
So alienation simply means the condition or the state in which one is divorced or separated from his or her true self. Okay, so for example, like we will see with St. Augustine, um, in the Christian worldview, right, one is alienated from their true state, right, as a result of the original sin. And so the fallen man is divorced from the righteous man or the man in his paradisal condition, his Adamic condition, his original condition, right, as a result of the original sin. And so life becomes a process of redemption through which the, uh, the fallen self, the alienated fallen self that is in this world, redeems itself and reaches the paradisal state, which is the state of the uh, soul that is once again with God and true to God. Similarly, we will see with Plato that we have the world of forms, right? the world of ideals, the world of perfect forms and beings. And then we have the reflection, the world of the reflection of those ideals, the shadow world, right? Or the cave, so to speak. So we also have this quest of man uh, trying to move from the world of shadows to the world of perfection, to the world of the ideals and so forth. Similarly, for example, in Islamic philosophy, we have the idea of man who is alienated from God or alienated from what we'll say Ghazali calls al-fitra, right? Al-fitra, the original human condition, the, the, the condition which man is born into, uh, this, this quest of returning to the state of fitra, returning to the state in which man is close to God and man redeems himself with God through good works and through faith and through assimilated to Christianity through um, uh, illumination and, and prayer and inner reflection and so forth. In the modern world, uh, of course, alienation plays out in different ways, right? So of course, it's, it's a theme that was heavily introduced and uh, uh, reworked in the works of Karl Marx, um, in the works of the existentialists and in uh, other texts. Now, with Gilgamesh, what was Gilgamesh, for example, alienated from? Right? Why was Gilgamesh in a state of alienation? We said that at first he was in a state of alienation because he was immersed and he was preoccupied and absorbed in the everyday life, right? in the aesthetic life, the life of desires and power and pleasure. And we said that he was able to realize his true self only when he understood his mortality and when he uh, uh, asserted himself as a good king, as an ethical king who left a legacy. So what is the alienation of Odysseus, right? Metaphorically, we find him on this island, but he is in the state of alienation. But he is alienated from what? He is homeless from what? Right? This is something that we want to begin to explore as we continue and as we move on. Right? What is the self that Odysseus is alienated from, that he is separated from? Now, it is clearly not the Trojan Wars, or it is clearly at least this is what is being implied in the, in the word odyssey from Odysseus as a war commander, as a war hero. Why? Because the Iliad, had the Trojan War has already ended and this text is called Odyssey and we know that it is an Odyssey back home. It is not an Odyssey back into war, right? So what is the self that Odysseus is being alienated from? So this is something that you have to consider and that's something we have to try to discover in this text as we proceed, okay? Now, similarly with Telemachus, what is the alienated state of Telemachus? Telemachus wants to understand what his origin and what his purpose is, what his true self is. 
Odysseus seems to know what it is. That's why he sets out on an odyssey, right? That's why he sets out on an odyssey in book five. But with his son, he is still asking the question, who am I? What is my origin, right? And he asks this in the form of who is my father? Now, of course, the gods intervene and they tell him, your father is indeed Odysseus and Odysseus might be alive. And so similarly, uh, Telemachus sets out on his own quest to overcome alienation and to overcome his own anguish. Now, what's interesting about the, the, the journey of the son is that the question of who am I, it is very similar to a lot of these contemporary films and stories that we find uh, in, in mainstream film and in, you know, more niche film, more different, you know, specific genres and whatnot, uh, such as the film Lion. Now, in the movie Lion, right, we have the story of a uh, young Indian boy who was adopted by, I believe, Australian parents. One of my sisters here, she would know. Um, anyway, so he is adopted by these Australian parents and he grows up in Australia and you know, life is good, right? Uh, everything is, is given to him, right? Life is made easy for him. There are no inconveniences that you would have, for example, had you been grown up in the slums of India and so forth. But at a particular phase in his life, right? He is faced with this existential question that we are all faced with, that is part of the human condition. That is similarly the question that the son of Odysseus will ask. Who am I, i.e. who are my parents? And so he sets out on this long journey to figure out and to discover who his parents are, right? You know, his mother and so forth. And what's interesting is that he knows that the answer to this question will not bring about any sort of material benefit. He's living in Australia and he's adopted from and his original parent, biological parents are Indian. So clearly the, the pursuit here, the, the question, who am I and who are my parents has nothing to do with any sort of material, uh, any sort of material goods or material gains or aesthetic pleasures. It is an existential question, right? It's a search for meaning. It is a search for purpose, right? It is a question that he must ask in order for him to understand the where to, where do I go from here and so forth. So anyways, in this, in this movie, wonderful movie, he ends up basically finding his mother uh, in the Indian, in the slums of India, right? In the slums of India. And he has this feeling of fulfillment. Why? Why does he have this sense of fulfillment, right? Why is Telemachus suddenly uh, uh, filled with a sense of joy or the sense of hope when he discovers that his father might still be alive, right? He has the palace, the palace, he is living in his palace, right? Uh, 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 he could clearly uh, set out and uh, define, you know, his own destiny and, and define himself as a man and so forth but he's given hope. Why? Because he's given a sense of meaning. He's given a sense of fulfillment, a question of who am I? Again, the question of what is the self? So similarly, this guy in this, in this, in this, in this, in this movie, Lion and so forth, he, he asks the same question that uh, uh, Telemachus is asking, which is who am I? I? Who is my father? Who are my parents? And so forth. In order for him to have a sense of self, a sense of identity, right? then he can pursue the question of authenticity, which we discussed with the Epic of Gilgamesh. So the question of alienation and anguish plays out in two ways in the text. One, when the self is divorced from, when the individual or the person is divorced from his or her true self, right? Or alienation and anguish can occur when one does not know what is the true self. One does not know what is one's origins. One does not know who his or her 
parents are. And of course, the question of parents here is a metaphor for the question of who am I, the question of what is the true self. So we have two very interesting questions that are being pursued in uh, this book. Uh, sorry, we have one question, the question of, of alienation and authenticity, uh, but we have it, be, it unfolding in two very interesting ways through two different characters. When we discuss Oedipus the king, you're going to find something very interesting. Also, uh, we're going to draw on a brilliant contemporary movie that is The Truman Show which also illustrates this question, the pursuit of authenticity, the question of who am I and alienation, um, and does so in one of the most brilliant ways. Um, hopefully we will uh, get to that and maybe we can assign it and we can watch it um, together. So briefly put again, alienation is a state, it's an existential state. Anguish is the mood, right? Or, or the emotions that come from this state. And it is expressed in uh, the weeping of, of Odysseus in this very dramatic, in this very dramatic way, right? Now, okay. So we have this state of alienation. Now let's move on to book five. We have this state of alienation and we have this pursuit for authenticity. Easy enough, simple enough, right? But what type of world is this pursuit unfolding in, right? If I were to say that Odysseus wants to pursue his true self, his authenticity to escape alienation, right? One of the questions that must be posed if a person did not know who Odysseus is would be, where? Where is this taking place? In what world? Right? In what cosmos? Is it a cosmos in which, for example, we have a uh, benevolent God, benevolent God, who is, let's say, guiding man in this pursuit? Is it in the world of, uh, which we will see the Manichaeans, which St. Augustine, where is there, there is a constant struggle between good and evil? Is it in the world of uh, Gilgamesh, where the gods intervene indirectly, right, to either help or to obstruct the pursuit for authenticity? What type of world does Gilgamesh occupy? Obviously, this defines for us the nature of the journey that is going to take place, right? So this brings us to book five. What is the type of world that Odysseus is living in, right? The world of Odysseus is the world that is uh, depicted to us by Greek mythology, right? Now, without delving too deeply into this because it's addressed in the common lecture, in Greek mythology, we have not one monotheist, a monotheistic worldview or one benevolent God, nor do we have two gods, as in, we will see with the world of the young Augustine, but we have a world, the, the cosmos of Mount Olympus, wherein you have multiple competing gods, each of whom, for example, has interests, has certain desires, and uh, arbitrary impulses, and so forth. Now, there are several key and significant points to be made about Mount Olympus and the gods and the pursuit for authenticity. When we say that I want to pursue my authenticity or that Odysseus wants to set out and go back home, what we are saying is that Odysseus wants to take up a set of actions, right? Remember actions are, uh, uh, those acts that we partake in, which are based on intentional and conscious choices, right? Not like, for example, me lifting a pen reflexively, but intentional and conscious choices that we make. So in order for you to pursue your authenticity or this pursuit of authenticity, or for Odysseus to go from the island of Calypso to Ithaca, 
this journey will require a set of actions and a set of choices. Now, in the modern world, right, in the world of modernity and uh, the scientific method and so forth, the question, we don't really uh, feel anguish, we don't really have this sense of um, anxiety or, or uh, uh, ambivalence when it comes to the issue of action and choice. Why? Because we have cause and effect, we, we have faith in cause and effect. Right, we have faith in the laws of nature. We have faith, at least maybe not in Lebanon, but that there are systems and that there are regularities. So when I wake up, right, and I want to get to AUB, for example, I'm not going to be worried about whether or not my car, for example, decides to slip east or west. Right, I have confidence in cause and effect that there are laws of nature. I have confidence that if I put the keys into the ignition and I turn the ignition that the car will turn on, right? Because of the force of combustion. I am confident that if I boil water to 100 degrees Celsius, if I put water to 100 degrees Celsius, it will boil. So I will be able to get my coffee. I am confident that if I, for example, study for an exam, I am likely to do well in the exam, right? This is, again, assuming that the institute is just and, and so forth, right? So we have cause and effect, and this is something that we take for granted. And cause and effect allows us to at least have some sort of comfort um, and have some sense of predictability, right? Now, when do we become anxious? We become anxious when we cannot really predict the outcomes of our actions, right? So I am confident and I do not have anxiety when I want to boil water. But I will have anxiety, for example, when I study for an exam because the outcome is less known, right? Now, imagine the anxiety I would have when I study for an exam, knowing, for example, that the, let's say that the test maker will be purely arbitrary, that he might end up being either Zeus or Poseidon, a God that loves me or a God that hates me, right? And, and, and so forth. The point that I'm trying to get at is that the world of the Greeks, of Greek mythology, the world that Odysseus occupies is different than the world that our minds now occupy. The world of Odysseus is an unpredictable world and thus the anxieties and the unpredictability that will constantly play out, right? With the Epic of Gilgamesh, we found that the obstacles towards his authenticity were really internal limitations, his own limitations. We will find with the Epic, uh, we will find with the Odyssey of Homer, that the limitations of uh, Odysseus are both internal and external. So, who are these gods that set up these obstacles? First, in the Greek worldview, we have the fact that Human agency, i.e. your capacity to act, does not alone cause events on the earth, right? But rather, the gods are also active participants in uh, this play that we call life, right? And they act through their desires and their decisions and, and so forth, right? So Zeus and Athena could have clearly acted differently. They could have told Calypso, you know what? Keep him. Right? Or that they could have decided that no, he will not escape. Right? Let's say Zeus or could not set home. Maybe Zeus had a bad day. You don't know, right? Kind of like the situation in Lebanon with our politicians. Second, that the uh, the, the the supernatural, i.e., these immortal gods, are more powerful than humans and are more powerful than what we call the laws of nature are more powerful than cause and effect. So not only are these gods active, but they can, they can disrupt cause and effect. They can disrupt these laws and they are more powerful. They have more agency than the agency that man possesses, right? Now, uh, uh, to make matters worse, the third point is that not only do they intervene, and not only are, there are these supernatural gods more powerful than man, 
but that they are also not always benevolent, bene uh, benevolent gods, right? They are not always um, altruistic, good willing gods, right? But that these gods have their own passions and desires. What does that mean? It means that there is no stability or predictability in the world or what we call the natural world. Now, the fourth point about the Greek, the Greek world or the world that Odysseus occupies and something for you to think about is that these gods are worshipped not because of some sort of sense of predefined sense of morality, but because they are powerful. Now, this might seem ambiguous and ambivalent, okay? Generally, when we think about God, okay, or the Christian God, or, you know, the Islamic God, or, and so forth, right? We have this concept, or with Plato, right? The, the world of idea, the, the realm of forms, the perfect forms and so forth, right? We attribute it to the idea of good, the idea of the just, right? The all good God, the all knowing God and so forth. And when we decide to obey a order or a system or a sect or a uh, ideology, we do so because we believe that it is just, right? That it has some kind of intrinsic moral value, right? Now with the gods, what's interesting about Greek mythology, at least this is my interpretation, is that they are not worshipped because they are moral or just, but they are worshipped because they are powerful, right? And this will be very important throughout the book. The question of, Power versus justice. Do we do what we do in order to achieve certain ends, i.e. power? Or do we do what we do? Do we act in such a way, in the way we do, because it is just, right? And this begs the question, in a world occupied by multiple gods, a world in which these gods have human attributes and are active participants in the world, and that they have passions that are similar to the passions of men. Can the idea of justice even exist to begin with? Can it have a place in this type of cosmos, right? And if it doesn't, what does this tell us about the journey of Odysseus? And what does this tell us about what Odysseus ought to do and ought not to do? How are we going to judge him as we proceed, right? How are we going to say that such and such is unjust or this action is might appear to us might appear to us to be unjust, but it is in fact wise, it is witty, it is cunning, and so forth. So we will explore this in more detail when we look at book six. Now in book six, that's when things start to get uh, I want to say dangerous, kinda. Why? Because finally he sets out and he is shipwrecked, right? He sets out for Ithaca and he meets his first obstacle. Poseidon discovers that the gods met and they left him out of the meeting. And lo and behold, he decides to take his revenge out on who? On our poor Odysseus. And so Odysseus meets his first obstacle and is shipwrecked. And he ends up on an island and here again, we will be able to look at the issue of just and justice, what is just, what is justice, and the issue of the gods and morality and so forth. Um, again, the three themes that we want to discuss are authenticity, uh, sorry, alienation, anguish on one hand, and choice and free will on another. But um, we will also explore some sub themes just to keep things fun and fresh. See you guys next week.